content of lecture 3, this input-output model and uh, how we can calculate uh, production and employment effects of, let's say, a given action. <coughs> like if a new company moves into a region, uh, what will happen or what can happen with, with respect to the number of employees and the increased production factor. Um, what can be the additional effect of an increase in demand for certain products or what can be the effects of an increased output from a certain industry. So we'll use that <coughs> information uh, to some extent um, towards the end of this lecture. But today I'll talk about uh, another important uh, type of model, namely cumulative causation models, and I'll give you a, or provide you with a numerical example of that. Uh, <coughs> before uh, we come to that point, I will talk a bit about trade equilibrium, which is a way of illustrating why shorter transport distances can affect a region's output and the well-being of, uh, of consumers and of producers. And those of you who had the International Transportation and Distribution course last fall will uh, recognize uh, that, so you have to apologize for some repetition. But uh, according to the exam results, I don't think it matters. I'm not. I'm not looking um, at you now, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> but uh, it's okay. I think. Um, <laughs> so I will. Uh, I'll go through this. Um, we'll come back to this general equilibrium when when we are going to talk about wider economic impacts later on in the course as well. Um, talk about export-led models which is a kind of a cumulative uh, growth model. I'll hopefully make it clear what I mean by cumulative growth <coughs> uh, later on. And I'm just summarized with how transport infrastructure affects these, these uh, growth models. So <coughs> let's start with, with the basics here. Uh, and this is taken from uh, this Valras equilibrium uh, notion is taken from, uh, from uh, let's say, microeconomic theory, which you may or may not have had too, too much of. But the <coughs> shorthand story is that all income that we, that we earn is spent on goods and services. And we are all uh, maximizers of, of benefits, of utility, and of uh, profits when we, if we are engaged in this as producers. The demand should, be, should not exceed supply, so we cannot consume more than, than is produced. So normally we assume that the sum of, <coughs> of demand is equal to the sum of supply. And then <coughs> when a good price of a good changes, it could be travel costs, it could be uh, a price of, a, of any good. Changes in volume and price will take place, changes will take place until a new equilibrium is reached. And if you reduce transport costs, you may uh, link two regions closer together and 
that may also then result in relocation of activities in space. So these, <coughs> these models are sort of introducing space into the, into the picture and we'll talk more about space later on, uh, how spatial uh, effects of, uh, of, of transport systems. But you, <coughs> you, you, you get the intuition here that when you reduce transport costs, you may, you or a company may want to move, uh, which can, uh, can have some, some effects on, on output in the, in, in the regions. So <coughs> when we talk about general equilibrium, we are saying that the adjustments <coughs> after some action is taken, like for instance a new, uh, new, uh, new transport link, then the choice of transport modes, the choice of goods and services to, to, to purchase or to offer to the market, choice of location, have taken place such that we end up with a new set of equilibrium quantities and prices. Just think about it in a very practical way. You can improve, uh, build a motorway or a high-speed rail system or whatever, and it, it will most certainly end in some changes, including relocation. So we, uh, we assume then that, that the consumers and the producers are, are informed about the outcome of their actions. And, uh, and the new equilibrium is the state of affairs where you cannot improve things further. So these, these are models. So you have, to, you have to bear that in mind. That we try to, to work out by, by, by modeling such, uh, such behavior how, how adjustments may take place. And models may not be accurate but they can give very good indications of what, what could, could take place. And it's also <coughs> important to remember that some processes are slow, whereas others are very fast. Changes can take place immediately. So mm. it's also when we, when we try to understand what can happen, uh, it's also uh, important to have that in mind that things can adjust rapidly or it may take quite a lot of time. And we can illustrate that <coughs> by this figure, where if we then talk about uh, changes, slow changes in society is often connected to people's preferences. Take some time to sort of change a consumer pattern of, uh, of, uh, of people in, in general. Takes, may, may be, it varies of course, uh, depending on, on, on what, what we are talking about here. But uh, if there is a technological shift you know, of some kind, it takes some time to adjust to that. Nodes and link in the infrastructure network are also slow processes because it takes a lot of time to plan them, to make the decisions, and to build new nodes and links. To get hold of infrastructure capital can also be uh, a process that may take time, it is linked to this one. You need political processes and, and uh, decisions. And also migration flows. The way people, companies are, are moving in space are also slow uh, processes. Even if, even if transport systems can improve, it takes some time to, for people to adjust. So normally, if we <coughs> are considering location effects, we don't expect a new equilibrium to, to be reached before at least 10 years after the, the system has been built. 
So when we, when we study this, we are talking about at least 10 years adjustment time when it comes to migration flows <coughs> as a result of, of a new transport link. Then we have the medium factors, uh, which can be uh, wage adjustments, scheduled transport flows like bus routes, need some time to, to change uh, a timetable, more uh, can vary of course, but, but some time. And then the capacity increase in the transport network, like for instance increase of vehicle stock, number of aircraft, number of ferries, or something like that, some aspects like that. And then we have the rapid ones, which are uh, financial flows, which can take place immediately, information flows, and traffic flows, like how people choose uh, which transport mode to use, which route to go from A to B, are examples of, of, of rapid floats, flows. So uh, <coughs> this type of, uh, of effects of a given transport link is we, we model such links in more or, uh, more or less sophisticated ways by using network models or simpler forecasting models, which, which are um, uh, I mean, we, d we develop such models uh, here at, at this college, so actually the the, model, the net transport network models that are used in uh, in Norway are um, are developed here. So when they are going to, let's say, consider a new uh, rapid transit link in Oslo to extend uh, the subway system, the models that are used for that are are developed here, and they they are based on this general equilibrium way of thinking, that people will choose the transport option that is best for them. The fastest route, the cheapest route, and you have always the, the trade-off between, let's say, the, the level of fares that you pay, the ticket costs, and the time that you save. So the models are trying to incorporate both time, value of time, and, and what you pay for the transport service itself. So I will not go, <coughs> go um, into that in, in detail in this course. Uh, if some of you are uh, hopefully uh, continuing with, um, with the masters in, uh, in logistics, we have a course there which are dealing with, uh, with network models in a bit more detail. But the point is that <coughs> the, there, there, are all there are linkages between the slow, medium, and rapid, uh, let's say, adjustments. Because uh, the rapid flows take place uh, immediately, but they are affected in longer in the longer term by the slow and the medium impacts it goes without saying that when people relocate they will of course also adjust themselves uh, with respect to route choice and transport mode choice and so on and this is the figure which some of you have seen before. Because, and I think I'll s use some time to, to, to explain it, because it's, it's different for understanding the outcome of the export-led model that I will uh, talk about later on. <coughs> this <coughs> illustration is simply a merge of two figures. And the two figures here are 
two markets. One market with high costs, high wages, and another one with lower cost and lower wages. So I start with the high cost. I can call it the high cost region and the low cost region. And the vertical axis of prices and uh, costs in both and uh, volume and volume. And now I'm going to, to, to simply draw a <coughs> supply and demand curve. In the high cost, it, will, it may look something like this. This is supply, and this is demand. Demand is increasing with a, with a reduced price. Uh, and the supply curve is increasing with, with increasing prices. Because when you expand capacity, this is the supply of goods and services, and when you expand capacity, the unit costs are, in this case, we assume it to, to increase. Well, this is the high cost region. And then <coughs> we, have, we may have a, a, a low cost region with, uh, with a demand curve like this and the supply curve, like this. You can, you can uh, consider them as, uh, let's say, this is an isolated island with uh, their own, let's say, they have a monopolist, they have one shop, they may have one of each of, let's say, type of private service providers. So the costs of, of running uh, or the, the supply curve for the services and goods in the, uh, in the high cost region, which can be considered as an isolated island, or not isolated, but in a way isolated because it takes time and costs quite a lot of money to, to, uh, to go to the mainland, can be represented by this. Whereas this one could be um, a lower cost region, which could be um, a, a larger economic system with more competition, lower costs, and hence a, uh, a supply curve that is lower. Here. So what this <coughs> figure in, on, the, on the screen means is simply that we have made a common vertical axis. So this part is according to is uh, corresponds to this part. And now what I have tried to illustrate here is that there are some transport costs between these two regions. At the outset, it is T10, and now we are going to consider the situation where we are improving the transport system. Let's say that we replace a uh, slow-going fer ferry service with a bridge or a tunnel, a fixed link, so that the transport costs are reduced from this level and down to this level. So that is uh, that is what I'm uh, I'm trying to illustrate here. The consequences if we are, let's say, merging these two economies together in a tighter way, not not completely, because there are still a distance to be overcome here represented by, by this, these costs. But these costs are much smaller than they used to be in the first place. 
So <coughs> um, this one, this part of the panel is, uh, is equal or corresponds to this one, whereas this one is just reverted 180 degrees and with a common vertical axis with, uh, with this one. So then, this is the <coughs> demand curve and this is the supply curve, increasing and decreasing. And you have the volume going in the left-hand direction. So <coughs> we have a difference in equilibria here. Because these are the equilibria that takes place where and the equilibria is, uh, is simply illustrated where P1 and Q1, this is the price and this is the volume of a given good or service in market in the, in the high cost market and this is <coughs> the price and the quantity in the low cost market and these the point is that these two can can now be they can be able to trade with I with each other because of the reduced transport costs so they can be better able to, to trade with, with each other. So this is corresponds to T120. In, in this panel. So now we reduce the transport costs. This may also be considered as two countries a low-cost country and a high-cost country. And the uh, reduction in transport cost can be done by means of some, uh, some technological shift in the transport system. One you can think of, uh, if you see it in a, in a global context, you can consider <coughs> the reduction in transport cost as a result of being able to use the northern sea route north of Russia uh, from, from China or uh, Japan instead of going via Suez, Mediterranean Ocean and to, and to Europe. So the, the Northern Sea Route is it's much shorter and because of the ice situation it's, uh, it is expected to be easier than to, to use that for, for, uh, for deep sea shipping. So that is another example international trade uh, here in this course it can be just as well considered as two neighboring regions with a kind of a, a transport hindrance in between which can be reduced. What is happening is that we get a new uh, we get a new equilibrium situation here. Because in the low cost region, they will experience a demand from the high cost region. And if you just think about it, if, if it becomes cheaper to, to go to somewhere else to do your shopping, you would like to do that. If you are living in, in Molde and, uh, and it takes half an hour to go to, to the shopping center outside of Olsun instead of one and a half hours as it does, does today, you would probably, or at least some of you, would perhaps do that. And that means that as a citizen in a high cost region, for instance, like Molde, you could, you could well uh, want to, uh, to go to the neighboring city uh, and then you are actually importing, if you buy something then on in the other city, you are, imp you are an importer. You import the goods from the lower 
host region, the shopping center in the neighboring city. And that neighboring uh, shopping center is, is then an exporter. They export the goods that they sell to you and which you then take, take back to take with you back to the, to the high-cost region. So <coughs> what we get here is that this is the price at the outset in the low-cost region. And because there are a, an increasing demand, uh, so, sorry, supply curve in the, in the low-cost region, if they start exporting or selling a lot more to the neighboring region, prices will increase up to this level. And the additional production that is needed to serve the shoppers or whoever from the neighboring region, the extra output will be equal to this, this part. So you increase the output from this level and to that level. Okay? Um, <coughs> when the price increases to this level, something happens to the consumers in the low-cost region. Because when prices increases, they will not be able to purchase as much as they used to do in the first place. Because of the shape of the demand curve here, when the prices increases, this amount of consumption will be a reduction in consumption in the domestic market in the low-cost region because prices go up. So the, the sum of the consumption that does not take place in the low-cost region because of the higher prices and the extra output that will result from the higher prices because of this shape of the uh, supply curve will result in a total amount of, of goods that are exported out of the region as a result of this uh, decrease in transport costs which makes the high cost region able to go in an easier way, less costly way to the low cost region and then um, demand goods from there. And their demand will then result in an increased output in the low-cost region and a reduced consumption in the low-cost region. <coughs> in the high-cost region, <coughs> this was the, the price at the outset, the equilibrium at the outset. When transport costs are, uh, are uh, reduced, they will go to this region and purchase some of their goods there. The new equilibrium price will drop to this level. Remember that we still have some transport costs involved here. So, what will happen? Price goes down. It means that when price go down, and if you follow this demand curve, the same as here. So this is this is the effect in the in the high cost market. Price go down. So this area here will be an increased benefit to the consumers in the high cost region. The increase in consumption as compared to this equilibrium situation, we get a new equilibrium situation, and this is the increase in consumption for the consumers in the high cost market that can go to the neighboring city 
and, how, and, uh, and uh, purchase their goods cheaper there. This amount is the reduction in production in the high cost region. Because the high cost producers will not uh, be able to sell their products to this price because of the competition from the low cost region. So this will be the reduction in, in, in volume of, of production. And the sum of the increased consumption and the reduced production in the, in the high cost market will be the imports. And the imports are equal to the exports here. So um, the welfare effects and when welfare effects, I, I mean the distribution of, uh, let's say, uh, costs and benefits here between the producers and the, and the consumers, is like this. In the low-cost region, prices go up. This area here will be a loss to the consumers. This will be the loss to the consumers because of the high prices. So <coughs> this, this uh, rectangle here is, uh, let's say, the increased prices that the consumers that still will be in the market and buy their goods in the low-cost region. This is the increase in payment price times quantity that the, the remaining consumers will pay, whereas this, this uh, triangle will be the loss <coughs> resulting, uh, which is a result of the reduced consumption, because uh, some of the consumers in the, in the low-cost region will be squeezed out of the market. So this is the loss for the consumers. But for the producers, they will be the winners here, because they will get higher prices. So of course, also higher costs, but higher prices. Uh, they will increase their activity with a value corresponding to this whole area. So they get this amount in increased payment from the consumers that are, that are, are already or that are still buying their, their goods and services in the low-cost region. And they get also these benefits or this, this revenue from, uh, from, the, from the exports to the high-cost region. So the net gain from this reduction in transport cost in terms of, of uh, let's say, net benefits to the low-cost region is the benefit for the producers minus the benefits for the consumers. And the net gain is equal to this triangle, A1, A1 B1, E1 is the net gain from this action. But still, the consumers are the losing part, and the producers are the winning part. And of course, the magnitude of these effects are dependent on the slope of this uh, demand curve, the slope of the supply curve. So you can play around with, uh, with different slopes and, and so on, but, but in principle, this is what is going to happen. In the high cost region, the, pr the consumers will gain equal to this area. But since the producers, some producers have to to close down because of the lower prices 
they are too costly. They lose this area. Because this is the uh, supply curve, and this is the pre-price, uh, pre and this is the post-price, uh, after the improvement in the, in the transport costs. So this is the loss for the cons uh, producers, and hence the gain from this, this trade in the high cost country is uh, corresponding to this triangle. A to B to E2 will then be the gain from trade. So the net gain from a reduction in transport costs will be equal to these two triangles. But in the high cost region, the consumers are the winners at the expense partly of the domestic production high cost production, whereas in the low cost, the producers are the winners and consumers are uh, partly suffering from this, uh, this, this export. So if you, if you think in terms of international trade, and if you think about the domestic industry, uh, let's say in Norway, this region had a very strong textile industry back in the 50s, 60s, and 1950s and 1960s, and 1970s partly. But then <coughs> trade was opened and trade was allowed to take place. First uh, trade with southern Europe the low cost countries in, uh, in, uh, that was uh, there at, uh, at the time, and, uh, and more recently with, uh, with China and other producers, producing countries in, in Eastern Asia. It's not much left <coughs> of the textile industry here now. It is almost gone. There are a few small companies left. But in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other countries, this uh, industry has expanded, India and so on. And uh, the there are, of course, discussions about uh, conditions for, for, lab for the labor force and so on, but, but uh, which is interesting and which has to do in that theoretical context with the, with the supply curve and the costs. But um, the mechanisms are sort of working like this. In the short, uh, let's say, a short in, in a very local, on a very local level between two regions, or at the global level between continents, it works the same way. You can also use this scheme to analyze not necessarily transport costs, but you can uh, use it to analyze uh, customs and other barriers to, to trade that can take place between regions or, or countries. So when uh, the EU is saying that we want a common market with a high focus on uh, as low transport costs as possible and no customs, no documentation uh, on the border crossings. They are talking about getting the gains from trade here. Of course, <coughs> this will uh, make some groups Worse off, producers and consumers, depending on in which, which country we talk about. But the EU has some other, let's say, counteracting ways of compensating for this by having, uh, let's say, regional grants to compensate regions with a, with a weaker economy and so on to, let's say, to uh, to support, let's say, the consumers that are, uh, are are becoming worse off and so on. Um, 
and even when Norway <laughs> negotiated for the EU membership back in 1992-93 before the referendum that took place in 1994 some parts of Norway was also uh, considered as uh, as uh, in the position of getting regional grants it seems a bit strange now as the European economy is not like that today. That, that Norway is a country that should be supported by, by the EU, but, but at the time that was a discussion. Based on uh, actually not this side of the panel, but this side of the panel, but, on, but the attention was towards the producers. Agriculture, fisheries and so on in specific regions, uh, particularly up north, that they could suffer from this uh, increased competition with, uh, with, uh, with the common market in the EU. So, this is, this is actually the backbone of general equilibrium. You reduce transport costs, you get gain from gains from trade, you get a change in output in terms of number of, uh, of uh, sorry, in this case increased exports, in this case increased ex imports. And then when we, if we have the statistics in place, we can calculate what an increase in exports may cause in terms of number of uh, increased number of, number of pr uh, production, uh, production value and increased number of uh, employees and vice versa for the high cost region. If you get uh, let's say a company located in for instance this region needs to, to, to uh, abandon their activities and move to another country or region, we can by means of an input output analysis calculate what will that mean in terms of lost employment and lost production value. And that is all what we are going to, to consider closer when we, when we approach the end of the lecture. Was this um, reasonably clear? So the next slide I think is just uh, elaborating or saying more or less the same as I've tried to say now and then in the next uh, session we we are going to dig a bit more into cumulative causation and cumulative processes cumulative growth processes so then we break until quarter past <laughs>